These are the whiteboard slides for the tying example that I did. So I started with the fixed proportions case, um, which I used the example of the left shoe monopolist. And the idea here is, is that consumers want to buy pairs of shoes. They don't care about individual shoes. We have this very odd technology where we have a monopolist who has absolute control over the ability to make left shoes, and yet the right shoe market is completely competitive. That's a little artificial, obviously. But on that situation, then we start off with consumers who value pairs of shoes at $102, where the marginal cost of making left shoes is a dollar and right shoes is a dollar. And then the question we asked in class is, okay, if you're the monopolist, what do you do and why? Do you sell left shoes alone, or uh, do you sell both and give consumers a choice, or do you tie? And the analysis we saw in class was, and it played out the way in a perfect world it was, it would, is the initial instinct is, is well, you ought to tie. That's how you exploit your market power in this situation. Um, and then you back up and recognize that the left shoe monopolist can fully extract all of the consumer value associated with pairs of shoes simply by setting a market price of $101 for a left shoe. And so uh, the market power of the monopolist, monopoly power, is fully exploitable without engaging in time. Uh, and this is the one monopoly profit idea um, that um, is seen as an important notion in, in Chicago economics. That means when we look at situations, one of the things we want to try to do is, is to see if, to what extent, we think it's a fixed proportions case or a, or, a, or a variable proportions case. All right. From there, then, we went to a variable proportions situation to see how that would work there. And the core insight of this analysis is, is that in a situation where a firm has monopoly power over a machine, they might like to try to charge different prices to different consumers for that machine if those consumers had different values. And the example here, and this is an example which I had a version of it, then Scott Hempel at Columbia sent me this version. The example here is one where we've got two consumers initially, Andy and Bill, um, and they do have different valuations. No one cares about copier machines per se. People care about copiers or printers or whatever it's going to be. Um, and where we've got a machine and then we've got these consumables. And the question one raises here is whether or not it's plausible for a monopolist over the machine in a context where we'll assume that the consumables market is competitive and here indeed assume that consumables sell for a price of zero, at least in the competitive market, um, then to ask, well, can I effectively extract more profits uh, by tying the consumables to the machine. Understand, of course, that there's an important practical question, which is how do you enforce that kind of tie? Uh, but, but hold that as a separate discussion until we figure out whether or not there's an incentive to tie. Okay, so that's the setup of the situation. So how should we think about that? Well, what you want to do initially is, uh, is to contemplate a situation where a monopolist would be setting a single price for the machine. And there are two natural prices here. One price is $140. 100, the Andy values the first 1,000 copies at 100 and the second 1,000 copies at 40. That gives rise to a total of 140. Bill, in contrast, values the first 1,000 copies at 100, the second 1,000 copies at 100, the third 1,000 at 40, and the fourth at 40. So Andy's total valuation is 140. Bill's total valuation is the 100 plus the 100 is 200 plus 40 is 240 plus 280. And the instinct of the monopolist should be to try to fully extract. And if the, in, if the monopolist sets a price of 140 then both Andy and Bill will buy. Contrast, if the monopolist sets a price of 280 only Bill will buy. Okay, what happens in those circumstances? Well, at a price of 140 the monopolist sells to, to Andy for 140 Assume it costs $20 to make a printer. Does the same thing with regard to Bill. And so the monopoly profits then are 240 140 plus 140 is 280, minus 40 is 240. What is social welfare like? Well, in this situation, we fully consumed the value <laughs> under the demand curves, and that's what these effectively are for Andy and Bill. That totals to 380. 
Um, the division of that between the monopolist and, and Indian Bill is a different question, but the total welfare achieved is 380. So, if the monopolist were willing to set a price of 140 for the machines, uh, the monopolist would make a profit of 240, and we'd see social welfare of 380. Okay. But what would happen if the monopolist said, you know, maybe 240 is not the right price for me. Maybe should I, I should try a price of 280. And on those, in that situation, Andy won't buy at all. Andy walks into the store and says, love your printer, love your copier, but it's too expensive for me. Uh, Andy's out of the market. Bill, in contrast, says, well, it's a break-even proposition. I just value it at that. I guess I'll buy. Uh, that's our assumption. Buys when there are ties. So the monopolist in that situation sells one machine for 280 against cost of 20, gets profits of 260. Bill gets no extra social welfare there. The consumer surplus has been fully exhausted by the monopolist. That means social welfare is 260 as well. Bill's 280 valuation minus the 20 to make the printer. So this is a situation where if the monopolist is restricted to charging simply a single price for the machines, the monopolist will reject the 140 price which would give rise to profits of 240, and instead choose the 280 price, which gives rise to profits of 260, and for our purposes, social welfare of 260. Now the question. What would happen if the monopolists were able to tie um, consumables to the printer? And that's what I've got here. So assume that the monopolist set a price of 60 for the printer and a price of 40 con for consumables. What would happen in those circumstances? Well, Andy would sit there and say, look, um, I can buy, um, uh, we're going to fully exhaust Andy's valuation here. He'll buy a printer for 60, 1,000 pages of copying or printing, whatever it is. That's 100 total here, 40 here. Again, Andy buys when they're break-evens. So we get $140 of revenues from Andy against $20 in cost, the cost to make the printer. Again, we're assuming that cartridge costs are nothing. 140 from Andy. Bill looks at those prices and said, well, that's, you know, that's terrific. Um, I'll buy the printer, spend, spend 60 on that. I'll buy four cartridges uh, at 160 uh, and, and that means I'll pay 220 uh, to the monopolist, less the cost of 20 uh, which means that the total revenues I'm sorry, the total revenues, for, uh, total profits for the monopolist or $320. That's just what that total is. I was sort of making sure that that's right, but that is indeed right. Okay, and that's a situation where both Andy and Bill will have fully purchased, and so we'll have total so social welfare of 380 What does that mean? It means that this is a situation where allowing the monopolist to tie actually not only increases profits, but also increases social welfare. Under the first version of this, the monopolist will set a price of 280 for the printer, if he can't tie, that will cut Andy out of the market. In this situation, if ties are allowed, uh, that will expand output uh, and increase profits. Tying looks pretty good. The problem is that's not a general result. So if we change consumers, if we if we keep Andy and then add a, a new second consumer, Carly, if we play through the numbers here, here's a situation where the the price that the monopolist would set for the machine uh, would actually make it such that both Andy and Carly would buy initially. Uh, and then the tying price turns out to be one uh, where uh, social welfare is less than what we would get in a situation where uh, the monopolist was just setting a single price. The bottom line on this is, is that with regard to the social welfare consequences of this kind of metering tying, we just don't know. This is a variable proportions case. Andy wants to match a different number of packs of paper or toner cartridges with the machine than either Bill does, I guess we call this person Bill, or Carly does. Uh, and that changes the opportunities and makes it such that metering may be valuable for the monopolist and valuable for society, or valuable for the monopolist and not valuable for society. That means if we're organizing our analysis around this idea of, of metering, and fixed proportions, <laughs> fixed proportions being the first example, variable proportions being the second example, there's certainly no base for a rule of per se illegality for time, which is at least nominally the U.S. rule. We can see that there can be social advantages. Now, one footnote to this. 
uh, the great cases in which this analysis arose, uh, the International Salt case uh, and the, the IBM case, cases from, from an era gone by, were situations where um, the consumable was the best way to do the metering. Obviously, today, uh, we've got much more direct technology such that my uh, copier in, our, in my office could be on the network, could be reporting back uh, to the seller exactly how much I'm using it, uh, and we might have direct ways of charging more for the printer without trying to use a proxy like consumables. Okay, so the bottom line is, is that in the variable proportions case, uh, we're not sure. Uh, sometimes tying will be socially useful, sometimes it won't. In the fixed proportions case, the one monopoly profit idea suggests that if we're seeing tying in that situation, it's got to be for some reason other than what we've talked about so far. We will tell a strategic story about time later in the quarter, uh, but that's not what we've done so far.